Good morning. This is the Alex 101 uh, course. The um, photograph there was taken about 300 yards from here on Franklin Street 60 years ago. I was just the average ordinary kid at five years old who had his suits made. Um, I have, I was adding it up for this talk, I have had the privilege of designing just shy of a hundred different categories of products between apparel and home furnishings and a few other things. Um, in some of those categories, there have been a thousand different designs. Um, I have designed every possible article of clothing from the shoes to your hat, uh, from tuxedos to raincoats, um, in the home, everything from flooring to roofs to ceilings to the furniture and the paint that go inside them. The extent of my formal training ended here at the University of North Carolina when I dropped out um, as an English major. <laughs> the first time I went to design school was to teach. I'm sorry to admit that, and it's not that I'm against design schools, it's just, um, and that's the point I'm trying to make, is how did I get to do all this stuff without that formal training? And the, the, the four parts of this that I think are, are, are most relevant are, are the words imagination, instinct, visualization, and a, and, a, and a very important point called cross-pollination. And we're going to get into those in a second. Albert Einstein once said that imagination is everything. It is the preview of life's coming attractions. He also um, thought that imagination was, was sometimes more important than knowledge, but I, I, I think I prefer the combination um, to put those together. Um, I was literally born in that store. My parents were very creative. I was, they both worked in the store and, and, and I had little swatch books to play with as, as, as a kid. Um, this is where I started designing my first collections. And I, I start with color itself. I have a vast library of color chips and computer abilities to create colors. But what was, what was different and what a great stroke of luck was for me was that because I hadn't gone to design school, I didn't know what not to do. And growing up in that store, it became very obvious to me at a young age that every piece of clothing in the world, what, no matter who it's for and, or, and, and what kind of shape, was based on cloth. And so I thought, well, if you make fabulous looking fabric, then the rest you can tinker with. And, and by accident, I became the first American fashion designer to design my own fabrics. Um, this is what you would call a field study, and this is where I learned a, a <laughs> tremendous amount. I usually tell people this is our apartment in New York, but uh, <laughs> this is a castle in Scotland. And, and literally going into these factories, um, I was designing fabrics before I knew how to weave. I was designing sweaters before I knew how to knit. It's just I could see them in my mind's eye. This was uh, my father's favorite fabric, and it's, and it's a color called Lovett, L-O-V-A-T. And it was named for Lord Lovett, who in 1847 had the first sort of baronial camouflage made for his estate near Loch Ness, because those colors were the colors when they were woven together that his beaters and his uh, employees on his estate could wear that and be, uh, be harmonious with, with nature. Now, 
one of my favorite paintings, Claude Monet. And when I started designing fabrics, you know, I, I was so drawn to Monet's work. This is one of Le Mole paintings from the, it was, I saw it originally in the Jeux de Pomme in Paris in 1979. I stood so close to that painting that it was saved from near extinction by a guard who came and, attention, monsieur, and jerked me back because the amount of garlic and wine on my breath was about to peel the paint. <laughs> um, but I was trying to, 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 to memorize the 50 or 60 colors that Monet put into one little spot in that painting. I didn't understand then why I liked it. Went to Scotland, that's at TM Hunter of Broda, and those are pieces of pure Scottish Shetland. They have a thousand colors there, um, and that's a sample carding machine, and I would blend 15, 16, 18, 20 colors together to make one thread, trying to emulate the beauty of what Monet had put into his brush. These are some of the examples of that. They're kind of hard to see in this light. Um, come to the store. <laughs> These are through the years. This is 83, 85. I have always tried to do things that were fascinating fabric that was usually multicolored because it made it more interesting and it gave you more guidelines of how to coordinate it. Spring silks, linens, and cottons. This is the kind of thing, I got uh, my reputation as a colorist for doing three really exciting colors called olive, taupe, and gray. <laughs> That's a fact. And then in 1980, I started introducing these jewel tones, and that became sort of my signature. I'm given credit for bringing color into modern American menswear, and I feel like I sometimes like Dr. Frankenstein. Um, but I was asked by the press where my inspiration comes from. And at the time, because I had wanted to paint, um, I was a frustrated artist. I, it's, it was in my head, but not in my hands. And, and so art was my inspiration. So if you look at this Rothko painting at the top and those color bands, then you look at the color bands of the sweater. I never copied art but I tried to get the kind of energy and color tension and relationships and harmony in there that good art has. This is one of my mentors and um, a, a, a became a great friend, Kenneth Noland from North Carolina, and his imbalanced graph plaids led to this, uh, I'm pointing here and you're looking there, I'm sorry, um, shirting fabric. This is Paul Clay, and, and again, the colors and the relationship of the colors in each of those fabrics. Picasso, Pretty easy to recognize the influence of those sweaters that I did. This is an organic influence because these multi cables were uh, uh, done by vines uh, organically that, that twisted together where the idea came from. This was a, a lady's collection that was inspired by architectural colors. And I remember spending hours, I bet there's 50 different shades of yarn in that sweater to make it look like it's marble. This was an idea just sort of happened. Ideas are everywhere. You just got to smell the roses. I was looking in Japan at, at a museum at Old Kimono, and I found this one obi, the broad belt, and, and it was all plain, and everything was plain except for one spot had this blast of color in it. I thought that was really cool. Uh, the top sweater here, sitting on an airplane traveling the country, seeing skywriters. Uh, the bottom one on those young lads was, was inspired by sunsets in the Southwest. Uh, that's an argyle in formation on the top there. That is, an argyle is a, is a tartan plaid turned on the bias. And I got my first Cody Award for the first um, multicolored argyle sweater, 14 color. And, and that's where this idea of cross-pollination, which is a, a big notion of learning things from one set of circumstances and applying them to a totally different one. And the first example I can show you of that is our basketball uniforms. <laughs> and, and there is Coach Davis 
now, who was modeling that in its day. Uh, that's the only architectural coloration I've ever done. It's, so far I would like to do more. Um, that's a baseball stadium outside of Charlotte. And I designed the uniforms first and then exaggerated it for the stands and then did uh, sort of this non-repeating regimental stripe all the way across the top. And if you look at it from center field with no one sitting in it, it is the world's largest shirt. <laughs> the spinnaker there was uh, as if it were a, a sweater. Um, another example of cross-pollination, when we started designing furniture in the early 90s, um, Argyle diamonds seemed to be just lucky for me. And, and so we put them into veneer patterns and carved into furnitures for tabletops and, and cabinet fronts like that. Used them in home design there on the base of these columns and around the fireplace. Uh, the knobs, you know, if I was designing a men's or a woman's jacket in that shade of brown, I'd put a tortoiseshell button on it. So I took actual buttons and transformed them into knobs for our furniture. And the marquetry around that is, is, is designed to, to look as if it's cut with pinking shears. I mean, it, it, you, you prove something in one racetrack and then you take it to a different racetrack. Uh, the, the flooring there was inspired by striped shirts. This is a new piece of furniture we're working on, this a miniaturization, that same idea with a new version of the tortoiseshell pull. Um, there's Paisley in both the fabric of the sofa and reduced to a bare minimum in wrought iron for the sofa table. Wingtip preparations. I found a pair of antique 1920s wingtip shoes and there it was, bingo, a design motif to use in wrought iron or carved in wood at the base of something. The top picture is hard to see, but it's, uh, it's an, in our necktie fabric, a factory, and that's the, uh, the patterns laid out and that generated the necktie table. I'm gonna go a little faster because my clock is ticking here, they're giving me. Uh, Double-breasted uh, blazer suit, uh, a bow tie table, a new tartan mirror that I'm working on. 15, 16 years ago, we designed a line of paint for Lowe's. And the idea that I had was, how do you make people comfortable with using color? And so I thought, well, nature is the way. And so we took eight sort of um, idyllic places in America and, uh, who, who, that symbolized those kinds of color palettes and used them as a way of explaining the use of color pairings. Segway, I was working on a lecture about 15 years ago and looked at this slide and I thought, oh my goodness, look at the colors that this guy's wearing and look at the colors of nature around him. Obviously nature came first. And then the revelation, the big moment for me was in Toronto when I got a color marketing award and they had a color scientist that spoke. And he told us that they had scientifically computer mapped this oak tree in full foliage on a clear day. Anybody want to guess how many colors? Do you remember the title of this lecture? 300,000 colors are in that. The human eye is capable of seeing somewhere between 12 and 16 million colors. So, what was Monet doing? I suddenly understood. He was combining the complexity of color that nature presents us that we call natural, and he was putting it into a painting. And I then realized why I was drawn to him and why what I'd been trying to do my entire career is to bring the beauty of nature into man-made products. The latest stopping point, and I'll go, these are Monet-inspired shirts with each composed of over 100 colors. And finally, one of the great honors of my life, thanks to Chancellor Thorpe, was to work in what are still my two favorite colors and redesigning your graduation gowns and getting them switched to um, uh, post uh, uh, re, uh, recycled uh, material made in the southeast of the United States. Go Heels.